You're listening to an audio resource from Redemption Hill Church. This resource is not meant to be a replacement for participation at a local church, but an accessory to the care you're receiving from your own pastors. To learn more about Redemption Hill Church or to give to our ministry, visit redemptionhilldsm.org. You say the word Trinity is not in the Bible, eh? Huh. Or is it? I'll explain. You're listening to Cornfield Theology. Hey everyone, Pastor Sean here, back at you with another Cornfield Theology Podcast. Thanks for tuning in, however you are listening. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google's got their platform, Amazon. You also can find us on uh, YouTube as well. And so if you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to do my best to put some text on the screen when it's relevant, just to help you follow along um, a little bit of part of the conversation here. And uh, yeah, today I'm going to talk about a topic we've covered before, but it's going to come from a different angle. About two months ago, I guess i got to go back and look at the exact timestamp. We covered the Trinity on our Cornfield Theology podcast, and it was good. Uh, Logan Kane, who is a pastoral intern here at Redemption Hill Church located in the Des Moines metro, he and I did a podcast because we've been going through in our church, uh, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, and so talking about God and the Trinity came up, and so we did follow-up uh, uh, podcasts uh, with those classes and uh, it's actually the second point, second section of our confession of faith. And you might be thinking to yourself, what's a confession of faith? <laughs> My church calls it a statement of faith. My university or college calls it a statement of faith. Yeah, I mean, some some would say, you know, they're synonymous. I would say no, they're not. Um, a confession of faith generally has historical roots, or it's built off a of historical foundation. So, uh, Presbyterians have a confession of faith, uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, I'm a I'm a Baptist, so um, the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. Our confession of faith is built off of that. Now um, we live in a different time, there's different language in terms of modernization of language, and there's different topics we want to uh, call out because of our cultural time frame, and so we've we've modified it for our time. But when I say confession of faith, it, it is broad and it goes deep theologically. And I, have, I am a big fan of a confession of faith. Now, there's a lot of great statement of faiths out there. Uh, there's a lot of cookie cutter ones as well, right? Kind of like, uh, what's our confession of faith? I don't know. What did the church say? Down, what did the church on the street say? Copy, paste, you know, put it in. You got a church plant with a statement of faith. Uh, you know, confession of faith is a little different. You really got to think well about uh, what it is you believe because there's so much. I mean, we have over 30 sections. And so, uh, some of these podcasts, who are Cornfield Theology podcasts, we'll be going through section by section, in addition to covering other topics, of course, um, that you, many of you who are listening are well aware of. And so today, we're talking about the Trinity, and specifically as our Confession of Faith references the Trinity. What are they saying about who God is, basically? And so, uh, my opening tease was like, so, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. And I say, no, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, for a couple of reasons. One... Uh, the, the word Trinity comes from the Latin, and uh, from I'm Protestant, I'm not a Catholic, and so uh, the New Testament was written in Greek originally, and then generally speaking, some Aramaic, you know, sprinkled in, but the Hebrew is the Old Testament, written in the Old Testament was uh, the Hebrew, <laughs> sorry, the Hebrew is, is the Old Testament language, um, and so yeah, there's a lot of reasons why I don't see the word Trinity, and here's the other thing, um, use your eyes to believe or use, use your use your mind to believe what you see. I, I think of it like this. Um, you know, this the 2020 and getting into 2021, and this is just going to be the case in America for until I die, you read CNN and they have a bias and a perspective on a news story. Um, you go to MSNBC, they got a bias and a perspective on the same, you know, the same story. Go to Fox News, they got the same, they have a bias and a perspective on the same thing that they're reporting on. And then you look up and you're like, wait, I can see exactly what's going on. And so it's, it's kind of the same way when you when you read the scripture, you can look up and be like, oh, oh, that's what's going on right here. And so I'm going to read you some texts where you can look up and be like, oh, that's what's going on here. All right. Got you. All right. So listen to this um, from Matthew 3.16. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, so you got Jesus coming up from the water. Behold, the heavens were opened up, and he, and he saw the Spirit of God descending 
as a dove and lighting on him. So you got the Spirit and the Son. And in that passage, and they got a corresponding passage in Luke where uh, the, uh, the Father speaks. And so we see all three in the same scene, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, what about Matthew 28, 19? This is like the Great Commission passage. So we got, we got Jesus' is like um, initiation into ministry. He's getting get baptized. Now we have the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. What are you baptizing people in? In the name of the... Is it just the Father? No. Is it just the Son? No. Is it just the Spirit? Is it just the Father and the Son? Is it the Father and the Spirit? Is it the Son and the Spirit? No, it's all three. Baptized in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. Um, here's another one for you. Uh, it's from Acts 1, 4. Gathering them together, he, Jesus, commanded them not to leave Jeru Jerusalem, but to wait uh, for what the Father had promised. So Jesus is like, okay, guys, I'm about to send it to heaven. I want you to stay right here because the Father made a promise and the Father always fulfills his promise. And what is that promise? The sending of the Holy Spirit in a in a unique and real way that had not been seen prior to history. So next chapter in Acts 2, we got Pentecost. So we have the Son referencing the Father who is, who is referencing, who Jesus is referencing his promise <laughs> to send the Holy Spirit to the disciples. Uh, here's one more just for fun. I use this benediction quite often at Redemption Hill Church. Uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the who? Not what, who? Person. The Holy Spirit. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So, again, we want to allow our eyes to see what's going on. Yes, the word Trinity, which is Latin again, uh, is not in the Bible. But we clearly see the idea of the Trinity in the Bible. So that's really important. So let's get into the confession of faith a little bit. What, what I'll do is I'll, uh, you know, read it a little bit, give you some thoughts on it, and we'll both, you know, try to help you understand what's going on. And certainly one of the big things here is you always want to apply um, your statement of faith or confession of faith. We want to apply the confession of faith to our own life. Like it matters that God is three in one. That matters for my everyday life. It's not just a concept that kind of hangs up in the air and that we only kind of think about and philosophize and theologize about. No, there are, there, are, there are ramifications in my own life about God being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's, there's three points in section two of our confession of faith. And the first point is really about the nature and attributes of God. There, there's more, more going on, but if you have to kind of like give you a boilerplate of, okay, help me understand in a couple words what's going on. It's about the nature and attributes of God. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity holds, talk about the nature of God, uh, holds that God is one, like monotheism. <laughs> That's Judaism, right? And Judaism held that God is one as well. Oh, hear, O oh, Israel, God is one. So the Christian doctrine of the Trinity holds that God is one, but three co-eternal and co-substantial persons. And that's really important. So co-eternal, co co-substantial, being the Father, Son, uh, the Son being Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The three persons are distinct, and yet uh, these persons are one substance, essence, or nature. I mean, they, in the early church, there was this word that they fought over, homoousian. Um, and there's a lot can be said about this particular word because it, 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 was, it was a battle in a particular context in a time frame, right? But in the context, in this context, a, a nature is what one is, whether it's a person is who one is. So uh, get to the homoousian thing real quick. The word homoousian means same substance. So uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are the same substance. Whereas the word uh, homoousian, so what we got here is a change of, a, of an Omicron and an Iota. The first one that I said, and I don't know if I pronounced them any different, frankly, but when you, when you read it, um, you know, kind of in the transliterated uh, English, it's the an Omicron and a Yoda. That's the difference of these two particular words. The first one, homoousian, would mean same substance. The other one would be of like substance. And there's a huge difference there. There's a difference between being of the same substance and being like something. And what was being contended in the early church is that they were of uh, like substance. Or of the same substance. Excuse me. <laughs> Don't be the heretic like I just said. Of like substance. They were of the same substance. They had the, they had the Omicron, not the Yoda. Not the Yoda. So they, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit are of the same substance. 
And so that gets into the nature who God is, that's the nature of Christ. And also in section one, we have these attributes. Uh, what we read is immutable. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna explain all these because all these are its own, its own podcast. Immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, entirely infinite. You, you almost need like someone else in a different voice, much deeper than mine, saying these words, completely holy, fully wise, totally free, and absolute. I could also add God is righteous. At the end of point one of section two, we read God hates sin, and he will not clear the guilty because he is righteous. That's another important point brought out. Uh, in particular, I would say the book of Romans. So uh, point one about God's nature and his attributes. And these attributes just rolled out in a list in our confession of faith. Uh, point two, uh, again, there's many things we could say about point two, but I, you know, I took the word transcendent. God is transcendent. Transcendence, uh, transcendence is a word theologians use to describe uh, God's unique uh, superiority over his creation and in what he has created. He is completely superior over. Um, in his relationship, to the world is is in part transcendence. Now, on the one hand, God is near. This is this is the awesomeness of God. Um, you go to the Psalms, and man, you just can't help but be like, "Oh, God is with me through this struggle, through this trial. Um, my enemies are you know firing darts at me, and God's there to protect me. So God is near me. That is true, and that is a beautiful truth that we can hold on to. We can also say, "Man, God is transcendent." We are not God. <laughs> you listening or you watching on YouTube, you are not God. God is God. He is transcendent from what he has created. God is completely unique from all other, being, other beings, whether it's human beings, whether it's other things that he created, like uh, my dog Winston, who I talk about all the time in my sermons because my dog Winston is the best. He's the bomb. He is my favorite dog ever of all time. When he dies, I'm going to cry like a baby because he's the best. But, but, you know, I'm different from Winston, right? Not, it's the same idea. God is completely different from me and Winston. Um, so he is transcendent. He's completely unique from everything he's created. He's, he's different from angels, right? Um, so this is what it says in our confession of faith, and I hope it helps you understand what we believe. He does not need any creature that he has made. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need Sean Powers. He definitely doesn't need Sean Powers. He doesn't need any creature he has made. Nor does his glory come from them. But he demonstrates his glory in what he does in them, by them, to them, and for them. He alone is the fountain of all being. All things are of him through him. This is like Colossians 1 right here. All things are of him, through him, and to him. He has absolute sovereign dominion. That's like a deep voice there again. He has absolute sovereign dominion over his creatures to do by them, for them, and or to them whatever he pleases. So God can do whatever he wants. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the struggles that people have with, with, with Christianity. It's like one of the hangups is that everyone kind of wants to be their own God. And God says, nah, Nah, there's only one God. It's not you. Now, you're an image bearer of God, but you're not God. And so God can do whatever he pleases. He sees all things so that nothing is hidden from him. His knowledge is, here's another attribute or characteristic, his knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent of all, all things so that nothing is contingent or uncertain to him. Man, it's just like when you read this confession of faith, you're just like, Whoa, this is deep. Man, this is going to take a time, take a little time to digest. And that's okay. That's good. You want that kind of theology in your churches. You don't want kind of like a rubber stamp, you know, statement of faith where it's like, okay, we know all these things and that must be all there is to God. And no, no, not at all. There's much more to God. I mean, when you, when you open up our confession of faith, we footnote the heck out of this. So you know for that what we're saying is not like coming out of at a left, you know, at a left field, but it's coming from scripture. And so there's, there's a lot here. So you can look at this and be like, where's this coming from? That's good theology. Where's the theology from? From the Bible, right? From the Bible. And so, yeah, you can dwell, you can dwell on this confession of faith and all these attributes that are listed out, you know, God being transcended from his creation is, is truly special. It is true. All people are created in God's image, as I said, but there's not a person who is God. So point three, it says this, 
in this divine and infinite being, there are three persons. This kind of gets into the nature again. The Father, the Word, or the Son. Now, that might trip you up, be like, Word or Son? Is it is is that, what's the what's the second person of the Trinity? The Word or the Son? Well, when you go read the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, you know, and you just kind of continue on, you, you see what's being said there. So uh, the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, and what we're continuing to use is just showing you the Word is the Son. So continuing on, I digress. The Father, the Word of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So uh, there are three persons. There they are. There are one substance. Substantia, uh, power, and eternity. Each has the whole divine essence, yet they do not divide it. And that's really important. Each has the whole divine essence, yet they do not divide it. And, and that was an issue in the early church. I mean, that's another, again, another podcast, but what do we do with the essence of who God is? Like, is it three very distinct essence? Uh, what, what's going on here? And so you can see how language is really important when talking about a doctrine that is so fundamental to the Christian faith. You really have to be very careful and very thoughtful about the words we use and how we say it. And so that's why I love what the 1689, and you know, frankly, the 1689 kind of like, you know, looked at the Westminster, be like, we love what you're saying. You're reformed. We just don't want to sprinkle babies. We're credo Baptists. And so we're like, we're going to take like 90% and just, you know, use it over here. And so there's a lot of similarities you're going to see with the Westminster and the 1689. So the 1689 is in step with Orthodox and Historic Christianity. I would say the same thing about Trinity Fellowship Church's Confession of Faith. Uh, it also says this in the in the Confession and point three: the Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. Uh, it also makes note the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, that's another controversy in the early church, the filioque clause. Uh, say that, you know, three times fast, the filioque, filioque clause. Um, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So um, that that really, that language wasn't initially in the early creeds. That was added later, added then maybe around the 6th century, the Latin churches. you got to think of it this way. It, you know, as, as time progressed and Christianity spread, you had the Latin churches in the West, you had the Greek churches in the East. And the Latin churches were like, you know, we're going to use this language that the that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. We're going to use that in our creeds. And the Greek church was like, no, we're not doing that. And uh, again, you go back to Scripture to decide, you know, what's the answer to that particular question? Does the does the Spirit proceed from the Father, or does the Spirit proceed from the Father and Son? And so there was a big, you know, debate about it. Everyone got mad. You know, everyone with pointed hats and staff started yelling at each other. Uh, by the 11th century, it was fully adopted by the Latin churches, uh, churches, you know, coming, stemming from Rome, for example, and rejected by the East. East, you know, Constantinople being the place for quite a while, being the place for the East. So the Filioque Clause is a big deal, but the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, I said that we need to make this practical, right? One thing we don't want to do is like, oh, great, great theology. Trust you. But what does this mean for our life, Right. I mean, it's really important when you think about any doctrine. You know, I believe God is sovereign. You know, that informs um, when I go through suffering, that God is in control. All things work together for good. What does that mean? So when things are hard, do I still believe that all things work together for good for those who love him? You know? Yeah. I mean, God is sovereign. Um, Take another uh, doctrine, doctrine of election. We've been going through the book of Ephesians, which I'll reference here in a moment. When you go through the Ephesians 1, man, it's like one precious doctrinal truth of, um, after another. What does it mean for God to choose and elect bef- choose and elect to you, Christian, before the foundation of the world? Like, what you believe on that really impacts how you think about God, what God thinks about you, and then how you live your life. Like, man, there's so much assurance of faith when you hold to, say, you know, the doctrine of divine election. Um, so, anywho... Uh, all that to say, the theology that just flows from section two of our confession of faith uh, really, uh, really is, is there to and intended to impact your life and how you think about God and how you live. So, the doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all of our communion. It says this in our confession of faith: the doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all of our communion with God and uh, comfortable dependence on Him. See, that dependence on him is that is is it the act you make um, in light of what you believe? 
Uh, Ephesians, like I said, is filled with Trinitarian language. It's it's crazy. It, Trinitarian language that is in there and is meant to help you understand how God is at work in your everyday life. Um, for example, uh, Ephesians 1.17, um, we recently went through this, just finally got out of, the, out of Ephesians 1 after, I don't know, nine sermons, and it seems like nine sermons was too short. Uh, that that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, so there you have some Trinitarian language again, Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him. This is Paul, these, this, these words come in Paul's prayer for the, the Ephesian church. So a couple of things. One, you see how Paul's prayer is highly Trinitarian, which is great. But also prayer is something practically we do. You know, we pray to God, we pray to God, and we pray to God for one another. I mean, I mean, that's very practical. You can practice that right now. I mean, you can just press pause on, on the podcast, if you like, and pray for your brother and sister Christ. Pray for your local church. Pray for your pastor. Oh, so much to pray for. Pray for the lost. Um, so that, that's practical. We get this in Ephesians 2.18. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. <laughs> Let me say that again. For through him, who's the him? Jesus. For through Christ Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Again, more Trinitarian language. Like, how do you connect to God? How do you connect to God? It says right here. Through Christ, we have access in one spirit to the Father. And we have access to that. Uh, we go to, I think about uh, reading... Um, the book of Hebrews, for example, we had examples of Christ being our, our mediator, right? So there's some practical, there's a, it helps you think about how to live your life. Um, here's another one. Actually, it's not from Ephesians, but uh, 1 Peter 1, 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Uh, sanctification, another theological word that has very practical ramifications for your very life. Like, not only have you you're saved, but now you're working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Um you're doing all things to the glory of God, so God is, you know, God is working in you to put away sin um, as one who is a new creation in Christ. So the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and the Spirit's the one that's helping you in that. So according to the foreknowledge of God, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ. So when you get saved, it's not like, thanks Jesus, uh, appreciate it, now I'm just going to go over here and live my life my own way. No, you obey Jesus Christ. You obey the teachings of Jesus Christ, like, if you ever want to be challenged, <laughs> I tell you what, if you ever want to be challenged to obey Jesus, and I'm challenged by this, go read the Sermon on the Mount. You know, if I ask the question, what does it mean to obey Jesus? Go read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and then call me. Like, that's what we're called to do. It's a high bar. But we're helped to reach that high bar and to move toward that high bar. We don't reach that bar on this side of heaven, but we move toward that high bar and in, in the sanctifying work of the Spirit um, every single day. Uh, so we are to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest of measure. So again, more Trinitarian language there, which is helpful to understand. Again, goes goes back to my original point. Yes, we don't have the word Trinity in our Bible, but don't let your eyes deceive you. Actually, let your eyes help you understand the Trinity is in the Bible. <laughs> the Father, Son, and Spirit is very present in the scriptures. And, you know, I got a blog post coming out on this, and, and this will be down the road here in about the next month or two when we launch our new cornfieldtheology.com website. Um, it's going to be on Jesus in the Old Testament. I've been doing some blogging just to kind of for our you know initial release and launch of, of our new website. And one of the points I'm trying to make is like, it's not, it's not like you get to, you know, Matthew 1, 1, and all of a sudden, boom, we got the Trinity. You know, it's like you get to Acts 2, it's like, wow, we finally had the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's like, no. No, no, it's not how this works. Now, indeed, in the New Covenant, is there something um, unique going on? Um, yes. Is there? Are there promises being fulfilled? Absolutely. Uh, but do we have the Trinity? Has God been co-eternal? Uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, before the foundation of the world? Mm-hmm, 100%. And so uh, that's just important to remember. And I, I plan to kind of help bring some context to that, help frame that for people and, and allowing people to see, okay, how do we understand Jesus in the Old Testament? And then maybe that maybe there's actually another po blog post coming up now that I'm talking out loud <laughs> into this microphone. You know, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. That's that's important as well. So that is section two. 
uh, points one and two and three of our Confession of Faith, the Trinity Fellowship Churches, one of the uh, Confession of Faith that we hold at Redemption Hill Church. I should add this. This commentary is solely my own. Uh, I have not been commissioned by Trinity Fellowship Churches, although I love my brothers. I just want to make that clear. I'm simply trying to help our local church, Redemption Hill Church, understand what, what we believe, why we believe it, and what is that? how does it cause us to live, right? Uh, that, that's the purpose and the end goal of these particular podcasts. So I hope that's helpful for you. Uh, I love this section. I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing to kind of work through sections one by one. And then you can go to our website, redemptionhilldsm.org, to find more content, more podcasts that we've done. Obviously, you can go to the you know you can go to uh, YouTube, Apple, uh, Google, Spotify, and you can get all the content there as well. And then, like I said, forthcoming, we will have a new website, cornfieldtheology.com, in which we're going to have podcasts, blogs, and then a resource page. A resource page where, if you're asking questions about, hey, uh, what, Pastor Sean, what are some good resources on parenting? Uh, we we've been interacting with with various organizations. Um, you know, T, um, Together for the Gospel, uh, Ligonier, Desiring God, um, I think gotquestions.org or .com, uh, getting permission from them just to be able to link, you know, uh, to particular blogs or articles that we trust, that we like, doesn't mean we agree with everything in that organization, but just trying to get, get resources into people's hands, realizing we can't write it all, we can't say it all, there's some good things being said elsewhere, and so that resource page is hopefully going to help, uh, uh, might help you, ho- hopefully helps our local church as well. Well, that's it for now. Again, uh, the Trinity is Latin. That's great. We all use the word. But again, it is in the Bible, and it's so crystal clear. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for tuning in. Please like and share. Put five stars in Apple Podcasts. That just kind of helps get it to the top when people search for safe theology. Uh, We're just trying to uh, give, provide gospel-centered content. And to show that, hey, from the cornfields, we like to think well about theology. We can think deeply about theology, right? Uh, we're not a bunch of uh, country bumpkins out here. Uh, no, no. There, there are people out here who need to hear the gospel, and, who, and then people out here who want to think well about theology, and that is our aim. We want to give that content to whomever uh, wants to hear it or see it. That's it for now. Thanks, guys. God bless, and peace out. Till next time. Bye. You're listening to an audio resource from Redemption Hill Church. This resource is not meant to be a replacement for participation at a local church, but an accessory to the care you're receiving from your own pastors. To learn more about Redemption Hill Church or to give to our ministry, visit redemptionhilldsm.org.